Good evening, my sisters and brothers and friends. Welcome all to you this evening to this another Bible study series. God has been good to us, and uh, this is light for your journey study. We trust God that as you have been experiencing challenging times, then you'll be finding light for your path. You'll be finding light for your journey, because indeed, we need light for the journey. This evening's study is based on the book of Hebrews chapter, the book of Hebrews chapter 12, reading verse 14 through to verse 17. Hebrews chapter 12, reading verse 14 through to verse 17. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled, lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For he know that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. My topic this evening is, can a Christian fall from grace? Can a Christian fall from grace? And not the question, can, it's not a matter of should a Christian fall from grace or will a Christian fall from, from grace or must a Christian fall from grace is a matter of can. A matter of can gives the idea of the possibility of falling from grace. And what do I mean, or what does it mean when one speaks of falling from grace? It speaks to the understanding of God. So it is then, can the Christian fall from that type of grace? Can the Christian fall out of that relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ? It's a question that is important that one um, gets the understanding and explore to find the answer. 
And where can one explore to get such an answer? No other place but, but in the, the, the word of God. It's not a, this is not a question of opinion or, you know, one's answer should not be based on one's opinion or uh, religious orientation. It has to come from, the answer has to come from the Bible, which is the word of God. And so what I want us to, and even the scripture that we read, it speaks to especially verse 15 as the writer encouraging the Hebrew Christians to follow peace with all men and holiness which no man shall see God. So here the writer is, ex is, 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 is exhorting the Hebrews Christian and by extension us as Christians, believers, to follow peace, right? Follow after peace and holiness. And as it says, without rich, without holiness, then no man can see God. But the point of focus, my friends, is having to do with verse 15. As it says, look diligently lest any man fail of the grace of God. So we are called to look diligently, look earnestly. We are called to focus our attention. And to whom do we focus our attention? To where do we focus our attention? Or to what should one focus his or her attention? Is God. The things of God. In fact, Hebrews chapter 11 exhorts us to looking unto Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. So here the writer is imploring us, is exhorting us to look diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. What this is suggesting as well, once one takes his or her eyes from off God, then the possibility exists that he or she uh, fail the grace of God. He or she will fall. You remember the story with Peter on the sea with the rest of the disciples and Jesus was way out coming towards them. And as they saw the image, the Bible tells us that they were afraid and thinking that it was a ghost. And so as they became very panicky, Jesus, gave, I mean, made an outburst or a call to say, fear not, it is I. What did Peter say? Master, if it is you, let me come. In other words, let me come towards you. Jesus said, come. And interestingly, Peter began to walk on the water. But as he started to walk on the water, something happened. We're not sure, but the scripture tells us that he began to sink. And as he began to sink, he took his eyes from off Jesus. And he now was focusing uh, on what was happening to him. He was focusing on the wave. And he happening to sink. And as he saw himself going down, he cried out. 
Master, save me. And Jesus stretched out his hand and saved him. Now, the lesson in that speaks to G um, Peter taking off his eyes from off Jesus. And the moment he took his eyes off Jesus, he began to sink. So it is in line with this verse that tells us to look diligently lest any man fail of the grace of God. Further down, further on it says, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you and thereby many be defiled. Now what I want us then to look at is to look at some, biblic some biblical references that speak to the possibility of the Christian falling from grace. And by now you would come to understand the term falling from grace. In other words, it is to become a back backslider. It is to move away from him that call you into his marvelous grace. Look at St. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 13. This is the first reference that speaks to a possibility of a Christian falling from grace. St. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 13. It says, he are the salt of the earth. But if the salt lost its savor, where it shall it be salted? It is thence for good for nothing, but to be cast out, to be trodden under foot of men. Jesus, yes, was speaking to the multitude, including the, the disciples, and he told them that you are the salt. What is salt? Salt preserves, right? Salt carries a lot of important purposes. But one of the purposes of salt, it preserves. What is Jesus saying? You are the one who preserves the earth. You are the one who keeps the earth. And isn't that a fact? Yes. Remember the story again in the book of the Old Testament as God was about to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah and Abraham engaged in a conversation with God. And he started a, converse, a, a numerical conversation to say that, God, if you find five people down there in Sodom and Gomorrah, will you destroy the land? And the five persons who refer to five persons who were righteous. So in that case, God would have the righteous people to preserve. The righteous people, had it not been for the righteous one, then it is a fact that the, the, the world could be destroyed. And so here is a text saying, you are the salt of the earth. But also it says, if the salt, and notice this um, conditional uh, word here, which is if. And this if speaks to the all understanding of possibility. 
So it says, if the salt, which meaning that the salt can lose its savior. The salt can become useless. So it says, if that same important good salt loses its savior, its substance, then it is henceforth good for nothing. So, what that is bringing out, it is bringing out the possibility of Christian falling from grace if the Christian loses the salt or loses grace. Look at St. Matthew chapter 10 verse 22 as well. St. Matthew 10 and verse 22. He shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that endure to the end, what? The same shall be saved. So this is bringing out, well, Jesus was speaking to, in a prophetic way, telling the disciples of the persecutions that they will undergo. The time will come when you are going to be persecuted by men. But though, you've per though you will be persecuted by men, you can still hold out. Jesus was saying to them that you don't have to fail under persecution. Like many Christians, this is one area where many Christians seem to drop the ball. They will be doing very well when it is smooth, when everybody is in their favor, when things are going according to their favor. But when the climate changes in that your friend turn against you your family turn against you your co-worker begin to speak unkindly things about you that's persecutions right that that child some experiences when you are undergoing very difficult times will you fail. So there is a possibility for Christian to fall from grace under persecution. But it is just a possibility because again Paul was experiencing a particular struggle in his life according to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and he prayed to God three times for um, the thorn to be removed from his flesh. In fact, he described the thorn as um, the enemy of Satan that buffeted him. And he prayed three times. But Christ spoke to him to say that my grace is sufficient to keep you. So, in persecutions, under persecutions, as the Christian goes through the different kind of persecution, let us know, let us be assured that the grace of God is able to keep us even in persecutions, even in difficult time. So if one fails in persecution or under persecution, this is where the possibility exists for, for that one to fall from grace. Also look at St. Luke chapter 8, verse 11 to 15. 
Luke chapter 8, verse 11 to 15. Hear what it says. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks a fish, will he give him a serpent? Or if he asks an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If he then being evil, know how to good know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them who ask? Sorry, I read the wrong text. Um, Luke chapter, right? Luke chapter 8, right? Luke chapter 8, verse 11. Luke chapter, let, let's read it again. Verse 11, verse 15, Jesus spoke the parable. He said, the seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are they that hear, hear and then come at the devil and take it away the word out of their heart, lest they should believe and be saved and they on the rock are they which, when they hear, receive the word with joy. And these have no root for a while believe. And in time of temptation fall away. Similar to the, the experiencing of persecutions. Jesus, of course, was speaking about um, the word of God which is the seed that is, that is sown, as, as it is sown, right? The, the seed has a way to fall on different soils. Some will, as the scripture explains, some will fall on the rock. Some fall um, among the, the wayside. Some fall among thorns. And of course, some which is a, some fall on the good side, the good soil, which is the word of God, right? And but especially though, especially verse fourteen that says, "Some fell among thorns, which, when they have heard, go forth and are choked with the cares and the riches and pleasures of this life, which bring no fruit to perfection." So. This is a seed that falls among thorn and it has a way to be coming up and to be looking good. But as soon as it, it gets taken up with the cares of life, right? There are those who the word of God is, sowed, is planted in their heart. But it, it did not really plant on the good soil of the heart because thorns is like the heart still has, in a symbolic way, thorn and thistles, right? And because of the, the, those thorns and the thistles that are there, the word of God is not able to grow because, you see, the word of God needs a clear atmosphere to grow. The word of God needs clear climate to grow. If you plant the literal seed and it grows, but as soon as other, you know, grass or so grow around it, and if you don't pull away those grass, then the seed will die because it is not getting enough air, right? It is not getting the space to grow. So it is that those who are taken up with the symbolic thorn, I don't know what kind of a thorn that would, be, would have been in your heart or what kind of a thistle that is still occupies your heart, the word cannot grow. And so the Bible says that it becomes choked because of the cares of life. That's a thorn, that's a thistle, the cares of life. 
And if ever a time persons are become taken up more with the cares of life, it is now. When cost of living has gotten, is getting so high and the price of inflation, um, not much job, the demands of the bill, and so the, the thought, the mind continues to, 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 to be wondering how the bills are going to be paid. I mean, how the ends are going to be met. I'm not seeing, I have deadlines, and I'm not seeing any way out to meet those financial deadlines. And one becomes so taken up with the cares of life. And by becoming taken up with the cares of life, then the word of God begins to choke. You see, once life is real, of a fact, we have needs of a fact. We have deadlines of a fact. But you know, I come to realize that one very important virtue that we need is faith in God. When we have faith in God, then it gives us a level of assurance. When we have faith in God, it gives us a level of confidence that God is going to come through for me. A level of confidence that my bills are going to be taken care of. I don't see the money to pay those bills. But there is confidence. The book of Hebrews 11 verse 1 says, Faith is a substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. So you tend to have the evidence of the blessing, the provision. You are not seeing it. But deep down in your heart, there's a witness. There's that evidential witness that God is going to come through for you. There is that evidential proof that God is going to come through for you. And so, again, it is in the same gospel, Jesus questions, oh, he of little faith. Because this is the challenge that we will have when our faith is small. And so because of the, 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 the faith that gets weak, because of the faith that is small, then we become more concerned about the cares of life. We become so concerned to the point where we begin to doubt God. And when one begins to doubt God, then that is where his word begins to choke. So, if we allow the word of God, if we allow the word of God to be choked by the cares of life, then there comes the possibility to fall from grace. Jesus also shares in a few parables of the possibility of one falling from grace. He, 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 he spoke directly about the possibility, but also he shares by way of parable. And look at these parables. Look at Luke 12, verse 42 to 46. This is one of the parables that he shares. Luke 12, verse 42 to 46. And the Lord said, Who then is faithful and wise and a wise steward, whom his Lord shall make ruler over his household, to give him their portion of meat in due season? Blessed is a servant whom his Lord, when he is come, shall find doing so. Of a truth I say unto you, that he will make him ruler over all that he hath. 
And if that servant say in his heart, my Lord, delay is coming, shall begin to beat the men servants and maid servants and eat and drink and be drunken. And the Lord of that servant will come in that day when he look not for him. And at that hour when he is not aware and will cut him in asunder and will appoint his portion unto the unbelievers. This speaks to the unjust servant, the parable of the unjust servant, verse 45, which I want just to look at very quickly, says, and if the servant say unto his servant, my Lord, delay is coming, because he was the master would have entrusted um, the business to his servant and would have said to him that I go and I will not come until a particular time. But after, you know, and the servant would have been waiting. And while waiting, the servant made sure everything is done in a properly way. But waiting a little bit longer, the servant began to say, you know, my master is delaying. I did not know that he was going to take so long to come. And just by entertaining, you know, the thought of he delayed and, you know, he began to, be, to become slattened. He began to, you know, slatten on certain principle, right? Not being faithful again. Not being honest again, not being truth again. And this is what I have heard many Christ, many persons who profess to be Christians, probably because they heard that the Lord was coming and they say, Why the Lord, you know, I thought he was going to be coming, you know, at a particular time. And the time came when the Lord did not put in his appearance. And you know what happened? They slotted. Some of them turned back. Some of them, as I use the word, are falling from grace. Because, you see, it is very important to what motivates you to give your life to the Lord. I don't believe that one should give his or her life to the Lord only because the Bible says the Lord is coming back. It should be deeper than that. Very deeper than that. You give your life to the Lord because um, the Bible tells you that, you know, we are, we are sinners and, you know, God, it is God's desire for us to be saved. In fact, Solomon says the old duty of man is to serve him and keep his commandment. So one's motive is very, very important. So you see, those persons who just give their life to the Lord because they are afraid of judgment or they, they, they feel that the Lord is going to come at a very, you know, early time, you run a serious risk. Just like this servant, because the servant, the Bible says the servant, you know, observed that the Lord delay is coming. And this is what he started to begin to, I mean, to be abusive. To the servants and made servants. So everything that was entrusted in his hand, he became very abusive. Let us make sure that we trust God for the right reason. And we await his coming because of the right reason. And you notice what happened? When the servant thought not the master was coming, he came. So when we think not he's going to come, he will come. He was caught off guard. The Bible tells us in many parables and many um, of Jesus' stories and um, as a um, biblical references, you know, that 
well, in, in the book of Peter, it talks that when we think it's peace and safety, it's sudden destruction. Um, the foolish virgins again, they were waiting for the bridegroom to come. The Bible says the bridegroom delayed. So, persons are going to be caught off guard. The responsibility that you and I have is let it not be you or me that will be caught off guard, but we will be found watching and waiting. This is a call, watching and waiting. We don't get slackened up with our watching. We do, we, don't, we do not become slackened up with our waiting. We still wait patiently. The book of John chapter 15, verse 4 to 6 speaks very loudly to the, um, to the vine and the branch. Jesus again saying, verse 4 to 6, he says, Abide in me and I in you, as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, and no more can he except he abide in me. I am the vine, he are the branches. He that abide in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, he can do nothing. There also remains in this verse the conditional um, clause of the Christian falling from grace because, and what is the condition? If he abide in me or if he abide not. So we can either abide, which means to stay, which is to dwell in him, or abide not or stay not or move away. But for sure it says, abide in me and I in you and accept, the, accept it abide in me, accept it accept it abide in me no more. It can abide in you. Um, abide in me and I in you as a branch cannot bring forth fruit. What is the condition? Except he abides. And this is a mark of the Christian fruit bearing. As long as one is a Christian, then you should be bearing fruit. Because the Bible says if you don't bear, then he's going to cut. The branch in me that does not bear, he prunes, he cut off. So we must, we must have ourselves connect, attach to the vine, attach to Jesus Christ, attach to the, that triune being in order to remain in him. Very, very, very important. Very important. And so I want us to think of the, the possibility that exists of a Christian falling from grace. It is possible. You see, if it were not possible, then... The scripture, Jesus would not engage his disciples and the multitude in this kind of a conversation. And if, it, and if it were not enough to engage them in this kind of conversation, he went further to bring out the truth by way of parables. So let these be warnings. Let the word of God, my brothers and sisters, serve as warning for us. And so, as it serves as warning for us, then we will seek to carefully walk with God. We will seek to carefully allow our step to our steps to be ordered and we will not allow our lives to become careless 
because what this is one area this is one one way in which a christian falls from grace is when he or she becomes careless you see once upon a time you care so much about the things of god you care so much about walking with God. You care so much about your spiritual life. You just desire to grow, to be close to God. But after a while, you are not, you know, you're living that carefree life. You do not care much about, you don't care much about the things of God. Becoming careless. Let's not allow our lives to become careless. And even to become what the Bible, you know, well, First Corinthians 10 verse 12 speaks to as becoming overconfident. And it says, take heed or be careful lest you think, you, lest a man think he stand he falls. We cannot become or allow ourselves to become over confident. There are those Christians who will say, it can't happen to me. Have you ever heard of a brother or a sister who fell into a certain ditch and instead of extending sympathy to him or her, you say, boy, that couldn't happen to me. In, it, it, because I prayed so much and you know sometimes you will attribute that fall to the person you know not praying much that fall to the person not attending to church as you have been attending to church you know that fall to the person probably not very much attentive to his or her Christian life, maybe that is so, yes, but we are not in a position to cast judgment. The best I think you and I should do when somebody falls by the wayside is to reach out to the person as much as possible. But never you say it cannot happen to me. You are you, you are where you are now because of what? The grace of God. Isn't it what Paul says as Paul saw himself as the least of the apostles but he says, I am who I am because of the grace of God. So let us not allow overconfidence mislead us. This could be a trick of the devil. This could be a strategy of the devil, giving, allowing us to have a false sense of where we are, a false sense of who we are. We are called to work out our salvation with fear, and with trembling, not with self, this kind of a self-confidence or this level of self-knowledge. No. It is daily trusting in Jesus Christ. It is daily walking with him every step of the way. Anytime we move away, anytime we take our eyes off Jesus Christ, the cross, then there comes the possibility to fall. But as long as we stay, as he says, he that is in my hand, no one is able to pluck him out. So we remain in his hands. Then there is the impossibility of falling from grace. It is impossible 
to fall from grace as we stay, as we remain in his hand. But the moment we decide to jump out, are we beginning to, you know, to work on our own? It is in every human being to explore, to experiment, to develop this sense of, you know, doing it by myself, testing it out by myself. But this is where the possibility comes when we try to go by ourselves, walking by ourselves. The Christian life is never intended to be lived by my own effort. It is never intended to be by my own effort of righteousness. Self-righteousness. It is all by faith. It is all by trusting in God. So can a Christian fall from grace? Yes, it is possible. Well, should a Christian fall from grace? Shouldn't. Shouldn't. This is not God's intention for any. But as human being who has who inherited Adam's sinful nature, then we are all prone to falter by the way. We are all prone to fail by the way. But as we trust in God, as we lean directly on him, then there is a possibility for us to be victorious in all our ways. I want to challenge us Christians in this very challenging time, in this very difficult time. Let's not take anything for granted. Let's not take anything for chance. But let us be careful in our Christian walk. Let us not give the devil no place because it is when we give him places in our lives, in our situations, then he has that foothold. That is why James write to us again in saying, resist the devil and he will do what? And the resisting comes in the continuous tense in that we continue to resist. It is not enough to resist one time and become laid back. It is a continuous fight. So it comes to the notice, notice the sequence of Satan coming to Jesus at the temptation. The devil came with one temptation. Jesus resisted. He came with another. Jesus resisted. Everyone, it is a continuous fight. Continuous fight. And why we have to continue to resist? Why we cannot become laid back? Because the devil keeps changing his strategies. Comes with different things. He is a devil of varieties. So we have to keep on resisting the devil. And he will he will flee. He will go. May God give us the grace to stand firm. May God give us the grace to overcome, to override all the circumstances. And by his grace, by our confidence in him, then there will be the 
impossibility of us falling from grace because we trust in him. We know that we are in his hands. God bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God and our Father, we glorify you, we exalt you, we thank you, God, that you who call us into this marvelous grace are the same one who keeps us going. And God, your grace is enough for us, regardless of the circumstance that will confront us as we trust in you, as we remain in the palm of your hands, we will stay. These are, the, these are the days, God, when so many Christians are falling away. Departing the faith. Making shipwreck of the faith, as it were, denying the faith, betraying the faith of God. Not because you have failed them, not because your word has become diluted or, 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 or weakened, but because of their trust in you has diverted. May we faithfully trust in you. May we continue to lean hard on you. I pray for those who are thinking about backsliding. Those who are scarcely holding on. I pray God that by your grace and your mercy you'll reach out to such a one. And give him strength, give her strength God to rise and to stand. Pray for those who are severely under the attack of the enemy from different angles. Pray, God, that such a one will come to experience even more of your grace, God. God, we will overcome. Those who do not know you as Lord and Savior, I pray that they will come into a saving knowledge of your truth a saving knowledge of your word and your will. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. See you next week, God's willing.